Welcome back, everyone, to the Crypto 101 podcast. It is Pizza Mind here, and I am joined today by Harsh Rajat, the CEO and co-founder of Push Protocol. Harsh, welcome to the Crypto 101 podcast. How are you doing over there? Hey, Pizza Mind. Uh, I'm doing great, Like, and I'm really excited to be here. And we're really excited to have you. It's 10.30 p.m. in the evening where you're at in Mumbai right now. And uh, I said thank you earlier off the air you know, for staying up late for us. And your comment to that was, it's crypto. Crypto never sleeps. You know, we're, work time is all day, every day, whenever the opportunity arises. What was life like, you know, before you got into crypto? And what made you want to adopt this crazy lifestyle? God, so you mean what was life when I had uh, Web2 friends? <laughs> And yeah, yeah, and regular friends and family friends. and hobbies. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, life. I mean, uh, the reason uh, I took the jump. I think most of us uh, have the share, same story. Uh, mine happened in 2014. Heard about Bitcoin. It was going to thousand dollars. I uh, and you know it was all the rage in India at that point of time. Like Bitcoin, there's this new tech that is going to thousand dollars. So of course I thought like uh, let me get some of it. Uh, and the moment I bought it, within a week it was back to two hundred dollars. <laughs> so yeah, uh, buy high, sell low. That was my strategy. But um, you know, but what it helped me uh, see was like it got me excited about uh, what is Bitcoin because you know. Uh, I I had a loss, so I had to go through, uh, or I had to see like how to uh, get it back. Uh, so yeah, trading is how I started uh, getting into crypto. Uh, but when I started trading, I realized that you know there's not uh, just Bitcoin, there's Ethereum as well, and there's so many other coins as well. Uh, so I kind of went deep into that. Then after a couple of years, I kind of realized that oh, you don't just trade these coins. Some of these coins, you are able to program them as well. And I've been an entrepreneur from 2010. I've been a mobile entrepreneur. I saw notifications, communications, and everything evolving over there. Um, so yeah, when I got to know that you can program uh, on this uh, blockchain as well, and uh, because of my experience, I decided that communication is probably the best thing uh, in which I can uh, get in. And that's how I started going into Web3. That's fantastic. Give us the high level of what you're building over there at Push Protocol. What problem is it solving? Got it. So, I mean, if you just think about it, like what is the first thing that we do uh, when we get up in the morning? Uh, most of us, we probably have a look at our phone and we see all the notifications from all the things that we are doing, uh, whether it's uh, important email or Slack uh, whether it's anything about social media, whether it's uh, any- letting me know I need to turn off the World Cup because I have a podcast yeah. in two minutes. Yes. So all of these things, uh, even something like chat, when we are doing something as personal as chat, uh, what we are doing is like we are chatting to our friends, but via notifications, right? So uh, that is exactly the thing uh, uh, that drives the uh, Web2 world, that drives the virtual world. Uh, but just think about it. That is just uh, uh, just a Web2 world. When you come to Web3, when you come to blockchain, uh, you don't have something as basic as notifications, right? So uh, um, whatever you're doing, like uh, whether it's uh, loan liquidations, whether it's uh, 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 any governance, whether it's even someone sending you a crypto out, uh, there was no way uh, for you to notify the wallet addresses, which are uh, the usernames of Web3. And that's what uh, Push Protocol basically uh, was invented to do, uh, which is basically enabling uh, notifications for all the services of all the blockchains. So basically notifications and then communications like chat and video for the entire Web3. And that's what we did. We basically have sent over 19 million notifications now. Uh, we very recently launched on Ethereum and now we are moving to, or we are launching on Polygon as well. And the idea is that we'll uh, launch on all all things Web3. 
Uh, and yeah, we are working with around 100 plus protocols, including Uniswap, uh, DYDX, uh, uh, Gitcoin, Polygon, uh, Decentraland, and uh, any and any and every service that basically wants to do notifications. Uh, so in essence, what we are doing is we are building uh, or we are bringing the uh, Web2 experience of notifications of chat and video on Web3. That's fantastic. And it's so necessary to have an idea of what's going on. It can't just be a one-way input of Web3 is going to take off. So uh, great on you for building such a useful tool, uh, allowing cross-chain messaging and all this stuff. We've seen a couple other uh, players in the space try and do something similar. What's your approach at Push Protocol over something that maybe is trying to... uh, Make something that's like super hard encrypted cross-chain messaging versus just simple notifications. Got it. Got it. So basically what what we knew and uh, I mean, when we started, like we started back in 2020. So the vision was always the same. Like we want to bring uh, all sort of communications to Web3. Uh, but I think what a lot of people don't realize, like, before you can build chat or before you can build video uh, out for or these services out for users, you need to build a robust notification uh, service or a, a robust decentralized notification protocol uh, that will essentially enable these services to operate. Uh, like when we are talking on WhatsApp, we actually are not talking on WhatsApp as much as we are talking via notifications. Even when we uh, are doing this podcast, uh, the Google Calendar, it basically triggered the notification out, which basically helped us reach over here. And even when we are doing video calls, uh, we are not doing video calls. We are notifying the user that I am. Uh, I want to basically initiate a video call to you, and then the user uh, notifies me, and that's how uh, these communications are established. So that is what we knew that uh, before you can do chat or before you can do video calls, you need to do uh, communication or you need to do notifications, and that's why we started with notifications. And once we perfected that out, we knew that now we can build like uh, the WhatsApp. Uh, which is basically or uh, we can build a FaceTime uh, out. And that's what we did like very recently, a month or so back. We also launched a chat, but this chat is just like Web2, wherein this chat, whenever you are doing it with a wallet address, now you're getting notifications as well. So again, the same user experience of Web2 uh, to Web3. That's tremendous. I didn't even know about the chat and video features and stuff like that. Um, that It almost sounds like... Uh, not just competing with WhatsApp, but Zoom as well. Uh, So that's really exciting. And in terms of, you know, we've seen so much censorship in Web2 and deplatforming and cancel culture. Um, How does your platform work in terms of all that stuff? Is it really open and anonymous for everyone to use? Is it fully encrypted? Or what are some of the risks that might be associated with using a system like what you've built? Got it. I mean, see, the vision is like uh, bringing communications to Web3 or, you know, uh, being the de facto protocol for uh, communication, uh, which can be anything for Web3. Uh, How does our uh, platform works? Well, it's a decentralized uh, communication protocol, uh, which basically means it's a network. It's an open network, uh, just like Ethereum. Uh, which basically helps in the web three adoption. Uh, it's not tied to a single app. Um, so let me just rewind down and let me just let you know uh, how web three operates, like in a very uh, simple term. So how Ethereum operates? Ethereum basically is a network uh, which is distributed, and anyone can run the network, and anyone who runs the network secures the network. Uh, and then you have these front ends which listen to Ethereum network and shows you your uh, account information, right? Uh, your pseudo, you have a wallet address which is a pseudonymous uh, 
uh, range of letters and numbers and that basically becomes your account and that is where you get all your account information that allows you to interact with smart contracts and so on and so forth. Uh, push protocol also does the same thing. Uh, push protocol is basically decentralized network. Uh, which is run on push nodes. We are launching push nodes very, very soon. Uh, and what it does is now, whenever any notification or any sort of chat or any sort of video call comes in, these things are getting tied to the wallet address of the user. And because it's getting tied to the wallet address of the user after getting verified and it's stored in the open network just like Ethereum, now any crypto wallet can just tap into this network and can show you all the notifications, all your chat out, uh, no matter what sort of uh, application you choose uh, as your Web3 gateway. So you'll get to see the same notification and the same communication, and you can continue the communication on MetaMask uh, if they integrate push protocol. And the same thing can happen on any other crypto wallet or any other crypto front end. Uh, when it comes to encryption, uh, of course, while the network is open, the chat and the notification in itself, they are encrypted. Some some of the notifications which are very public can be non-encrypted, but all the notifications on all the chats that you do, they have the option of getting encrypted. So it's basically wallet to wallet encrypted, end to end encrypted, open network communication that happens. That's fantastic. Uh, I really love the idea of everyone in Web3, no matter which corner they're in, being able to communicate with each other. And that really is the future. Is there a token that kind of guards against spam or do you have to pay to receive notifications or send messages? How does that work? Got it. So yeah, we do have a token. Uh, it's called Push. Uh, it basically has four major use cases. Uh, like the first major use case is, of course, these validator nodes that we have, uh, which is used to secure the network. The push token is used as a proof of stake. Uh, the second major use case is uh, that this is a live communication middleware, uh, which basically means that it does have settings and it does have spam control and uh, a lot of features that will be tweaked in the future. And the token basically is used to enable those sort of tweaking because we don't want any centralized control to it. We just want to build this in as, min, as much decentralized sense as possible. Uh, the third use case is that we basically put 53% of the push tokens to push DAO. The idea is that this is a communication layer built by Web3 for Web3. And so the community should decide like what should be done with those funds and how those funds can be activated. And the fourth and the coolest use case uh, the communication protocol has is something that we call the fee pool. Uh, wherein um, whatever fees we'll charge uh, in the future uh, to these services who are utilizing uh, um, the notifications from push or to the super users of push chat, uh, all of these fees that is collected will go directly to the protocol and uh, uh, token holders, they decide like what part of that fee pool goes to what all crypto wallets that have adopted or integrated push protocol into them, uh, making it sort of a very circular, uh, very active uh, economy. Uh, for users, the notifications or the chats, they are always going to be free. Uh, push might charge some of the premium users like Telegram uh, charges their super users in the future. And uh, for notification also, it's going to be free. Uh, unless you know you're sending a lot of notifications out, in that case we will be charging services. But for most part of the things, it will always be free for the users. So very much like Web two interface and the Web two UX. That's brilliant. I, I think it that's the biggest hurdle to overcome in Web three is the Web two free experience that is going to be really really difficult to tell people, yeah, you can use exactly what you're using, but now you have to go collect a thousand different tokens and figure out which wallet to use uh, and take 10 minutes extra time every time you want to go visit somewhere. And by the way, like your web browser doesn't connect to any of this stuff. 
So exactly. uh, you have to yeah. learn to use Web3 and payers to do that. Yeah, exactly. So having a normal free experience, I think, is going to be the challenge for a lot of Web3 developers. It's great to hear that you've already solved that. So um, that's tremendous. You know, what are some of the lessons you've learned along the way since becoming a builder in this space, you know, for almost a decade now? Got it. I mean, some of the lessons that I've learned and that I tell people, uh, like Push started from a hackathon back in 2020. And I tell everyone, like, this is the best way you can start a project out. Um, because if you go to a hackathon, a couple of things happen. Uh, the first thing is like you might have an idea of your project, but what happens is like the hackathon mentors, they will know the exact tools which you can use to make the best version of your idea out, right? And that is something that you need, especially in the early stages. The second thing that happens is like because hackathons are judged by a lot of Web3 leaders, so your idea is put directly in front of them. And in some extent, like including us, we basically got judged by Mariano Conti. Uh, and later on, he... Basically, One of the co-founders of MakerDAO. Yes. And uh, later on, he basically uh, became an investor in the protocol. And not only that, he became a very good friend. And because of that, we were able to tap into the experience. So that is one thing which I'll tell all the builders to do. Uh, the other thing I tell the builders to do is be shameless in asking questions. Uh, a lot of times we think that uh, my question is maybe stupid and I should not ask. Um, but yeah, no question is stupid. Uh, I, I kind of was scared in asking these things out when I started because I thought, again, I might look dumb. But it isn't the case anytime. Uh, so, or it isn't the case when uh, when people are nice or when people are good. And the Ethereum community overall is really, really awesome. Uh, and yeah, the third thing I tell builders is that uh, don't be afraid in asking for help. Uh, like we did that. And because of that, we got, uh, uh, like when we launched our early uh, idea out, uh, we got responses from Kevin Owaki. We got responses from... Uh, Dan Finlay, uh, even uh, from the graph. And that basically motivated us. And it also, these people also started helping us out to realize what we are building and how to build it right, or how to pitch right, or how to form the community right, and so on and so forth. And I think we have asked for help from over 100 or so Web3 leaders. And most of them, they basically helped us out. And that's why we are here. So that's my advice to all the builders that are coming into this space. That's so inspirational. I mean, I always wanted to be a builder, but I made a decision at 16 years old that I didn't want to learn how to code because all my friends were learning C++ at that time. And they're just tearing their hair out. And I said, okay, none for me. Right. But you, know, you mentioned you know, there's so many developer tools now. It's not just coding every last little thing in Notepad++ anymore. Um, if I were to go to a hackathon with some good ideas, but no coding skills, you know, is that something that normal people do and they just meet up with other developers and like teams form, or does everyone go in there with their own idea of what to build in their own teams already? Got it. It's definitely the first one. So you don't have to like a lot of people have this misconception that a hackathon means that you have to be a hardcore coder, but that's not really the case. Uh, it's not uncommon to see people who are good at marketing or who have an idea and look are looking for technical founders or co-founders to build this out uh, in the hackathon. And you can do both. Like if you are a hardcore developer, you can basically go and build this out on your own. But hackathons, they usually recommend you form a team. And there's a reason for that. Like if you're doing it as a hobby, it works if you want to do it like single-handedly. But if you want this idea to become a startup in the future, you don't really need just uh, technical expertise. You definitely need people who can market. You definitely need people who can build communities. You definitely need people who can uh, do operations and so many other things as well, right? So... Uh, 
it doesn't matter who you are you can definitely go you can form your team and you can execute your idea you don't have to code you can be good in marketing you can just have a great idea uh you can go to hackathon form a team and take it forward from there that's a so amazing uh i'm definitely going to go now um what are some of the best hackathons to attend should i start in like a, something that's local to my area or are there like a big 3 or 4 across the world uh that are a better use of time to attend i mean because i started from eat global i'm going to give a shout out to them like they're the best uh, hackathons uh, not only me like one and just started from eat global as well so uh, a lot of cool projects have started from eat global uh, uh in terms of doing it locally or doing it online so eat global has these online versions of the hackathon uh wherein if you're not able to make it to uh, uh let's say a venue you can do it online as well uh and apart from that eat global constantly organizes uh, hackathons across all all over the countries uh for example uh in 10 days eat india is going to happen uh which is why i am here in bombay uh we basically had a guild with polygon where we were speaking uh and polygon was speaking and now we are going to bangalore where in uh uh we'll wrap up this polygon guild and then eat india starts where in we'll be there uh, giving our api access and uh everything out to these hackers uh who will come and build cool cool things so uh definitely just keep an eye out at all the hackathons uh, that eat india hosted uh i think they have over, they hosted around 16 hackathons this year round so definitely you'll find something that is close to your location and just go out and build on that or otherwise if you don't want to you can just do it online as well they do have online hackathons also That's fantastic. Uh I'll definitely have to look into that ETH Global and they've got so many other uh local things going on as well. Um let's talk ab- about web3 in India because if we look at who the biggest winners are, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the road, it's hard to say that India itself is not going to be the biggest winner from the evolution of crypto and web3. Just what kind of impact do you foresee it having on the average daily life there in India? got it i mean india is like there's this joke i crack uh, like whenever or wherever in uh, we as indians we come in we come in numbers uh so yeah india uh, and when it comes to web3 uh it's a very hot market over here Uh, a lot of web three builders, uh, like India, has been very tech oriented anyway. So uh, the jump from web two to web three is a bit easy, and a lot of uh, blockchains they are targeting India because they kind of realize the potential India has, and that's why India has uh, India has been becoming a very good hotspot uh, for getting all the talents uh, when it comes to the web3 and the impact it has on indians so one thing the web3 did was that uh, with uh, i mean with the advent of web3 a lot of indian entrepreneurs they started coming uh, into the global limelight like one of uh, uh, one of the project that we probably know about is polygon uh that's a indian project or that started from india um uh of course there is uh, push that's us uh but other than that there are a lot of other projects also that are coming up or that are competing with uh, global products so that's something which has uh, which which india has seen which is uh, a drastic change from the web to world uh in the web to world you Indians were not seen as uh, entrepreneurs as much as uh, intellectuals who solved a problem uh, or for the service oriented industry uh, but with web3 what we are seeing is like Indians are leading in entrepreneurship and innovation uh, so yeah that's that's that to me is one of the biggest scenes that i've seen in india web3 ecosystem In the Indian culture, is there any preference towards using products and services that were built in India 
Uh, I mean, yes and no. I think Indians, they kind of gravitate towards uh, uh, whether service is good enough or not, uh, which is the reason why uh, basically Amazon does relatively well in India than one of the local starters. But at the same time, uh, Netflix performs poorly in India. So I think if something is Indian made, it does have the advantage that people will try it out. But eventually people will only stick uh, to a product or a service that is outperforming. So in terms of uh, shopping, uh, Amazon outperformed a local Indian uh, startup. And that's why they are leading now even when the local Indian startup started early. And uh, in terms of Netflix versus the other platform, the other platform basically started after Netflix, but they were doing well or they were offering service as well. And uh, that's why they are here. So I would say that being an Indian uh, uh, founder or an Indian product will make Indians try your product out for sure but they will only go for the product that they like and the product that they find uh, satisfies their needs. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But that's cool that they're at least willing to try it if it's local. Yes. Uh, that's a huge leg up on um, on many other places and regions in the world. So that's awesome to know. Um, you know, who's one person in this space that's really inspired you to continue doing what you do? Uh, you mentioned Mariano Conti already from Maker was a, a huge... Um, you know, partner with you over there at Push. Uh, who else that you want to give a shout out to? Got it. I mean, there's so many that have helped us. Uh, but I think Balaji. Uh, Balaji is also an investor. Yeah. Uh, and he's one of the sharpest mind we have met. Uh, I would also say DeFi Dad. Like, I really love DeFi Dad. Uh, he's also an investor and a uh, friend now. Uh, and to an extent, almost all of the Ethereum Web3 leaders I've met, uh, including like Dan Finley or Kevin Owaki or Simona Pop or, uh, uh, or The Graph or Yane from The Graph or, I mean, countless others uh, uh, like Austin Griffith or uh, um, Anthony Sassano or Sandeep uh, uh, from Polygon. Uh, I mean, all of them, they have kind of helped us a ton in getting to where we are. So I would say that's that's why I say like the Ethereum community is really, really awesome. Uh, but shout out to all of them. Apart from that, even shout out to all the VCs that have been super helpful and that have backed us. So VCs like Tiger Global or uh, Parafy or A Capital or around 40 or so VCs that have backed us up. They have always helped us in one part or the other. So shout out to all of them and shout out to uh, especially some of the VCs or uh, people that I might have missed. So, yeah. I think it's so beautiful that in the traditional world um, where you're really struggling and trying to take an edge and, you know, maybe you can count on one hand how many people have helped you along the way versus tried to just take from you. But in Web3, there's just an overwhelming network of collaboration and people that want to help make things better. Uh, the Web3 world is definitely going to be a lot more beautiful than what we all grew up on. Um, and the people who are born into Web3 and are raised from day one with that spirit of collaboration rather than competition uh, are one day going to be in charge of the world. And I'm very, very excited for those days uh, that lie ahead of us. Yep. For people I who are listening, go ahead. Yeah. So I was saying, like, I think the beauty of Web3 is composability. And a lot of people, they they embrace that idea that they want to be composable. So uh, you don't want to reinvent, reinvent the wheel. You definitely want to help the other person out. You basically are building for a better future of tech instead of the better future of your company. Uh, which is something which I really like about Web3 because it's not about your company's survival. It's about uh, the community. It's about how 
a product will survive rather than how your company will survive, which I think is the biggest differentiator between a Web2 and a Web3 company. Yeah, it really doesn't matter if anything we're building today is here 100 or 150 years from now. It's just about moving the world forward. Yes. Um, and that's great because there's no scarcity in Web3 other than maybe Solidity developers. But yes. <laughs> everyone has time. Um and everyone's got some airline miles, hopefully, that they can go to one of these hackathons and meetups and make new friends. Um, and yeah, it's really great. You know, if someone's listening to this podcast for the first time as they're just now, you know, reading about crypto and just you know wanting to get in now that prices are, you know, rock bottom lows for this market cycle and they see all this bad news and things collapsing around them. And, you know, this trusted guy is a scammer and that thing's falling apart. You know, what would you say to anyone who's wanting to get into crypto right now? Oh, wow. Uh, so I have so many opinions on this. Uh, like first, let them loose. <laughs> awesome. So first of all, like uh, uh, the bad news in crypto uh, that we are going through, like the collapse of FTX, uh, that basically what people have pinned it down to is that crypto caused all of this. Uh, in actual words, that is not true. Uh, what caused all of it was our trust uh, and our reliance on centralized things. And that was one of the things that motivated us to create a decentralized communication protocol. Like, we don't want the world where uh the app controls your data and the app controls your communication so facebook can send you anything and facebook can project you anything and there's no way for you to verify that this is real or not real and in a way that was the same thing that happened with these exchanges as well uh these exchanges they provided you the gateway to get crypto uh but they provide you in a centralized fashion and i think after so many, like, I think exchanges, the type of exchanges collapse, they're very synonymous to the bank collapse that we have seen, wherein you have a centralized uh, entity uh, saying that trust us and we are here to stay. And all of a sudden, you know, you find out that you have been cheated. Uh, so, yeah, I would say like crypto is suffering because of centralization, but it's the blame for it is going to crypto directly. Uh, I think exchanges, they need to be held accountable. Uh, I know the UX and users, they don't want to learn a lot when it comes to buying into crypto, at least at the very first point of time. So they prefer these exchanges. But at the very least, I think uh, uh, what Vitalik has suggested very recently, he worked on it with Balaji and Kraken and other exchanges to come up with a proof of reserve protocol. I think exchanges needs to, they need to adopt that. Uh, that is one thing I think will probably save a lot of these disasters. I also think that users, they need to move away from exchanges whenever they think they're ready uh, because ex exchanges are just, I mean, not many people realize, but exchanges are basically just uh, uh, a centralized uh, way of owning crypto. And crypto by its very nature uh, was made to say that, hey, we are decentralized. We, you don't have to trust us. Like you don't have to trust the money. It doesn't matter whether any government is saying that or any big bank is saying that or Google is saying that or Apple is saying that or Microsoft is saying that. Crypto, the vision was that math is saying that this is right and this is wrong. And that math will be valid no matter you run it or I run it or anyone else run it. And exchanges, they basically kind of went through that same concentration of power because people uh, still have to learn and Web3 UX still has to improve a lot. So people kind of wanted to come into the same thing and exchanges provided them that. Uh, but I would say like these exchanges, they kind of need to uh, behave more like Web3. 
kind of need to have some sort of proof, some sort of on-chain proof at the very least if they're not going into the decentralized exchange part as well, uh, at least for the short term, uh, for this to not happen again and again. Uh, it basically brings a very bad name to the industry and uh, in a way the industry is not really responsible for that because this is what the industry wants to eliminate by the likes of Uniswap and by the likes of Dexes, wherein there's no trust between anyone, even when you are trading. Everything is trustless. Everything is mathematical. Uh, so, yeah, I would say it's a bad phase that we have right now. Uh, of course, it will pass, but it will take some time for people to start trusting uh, crypto again. Uh, of course, it will trigger some unwanted attention to the industry. Uh, it will also trigger some unfair regulations, uh, again, because people don't understand uh, this concept behind centralized exchanges and crypto and why it's completely different. So, so yeah, I think as an industry, we as an industry whole, we should start or we should try to be more transparent. Uh, we should try to be more uh, uh, user friendly and uh, we should try to uh, we should try to hold ourselves to high standards because if we don't do that uh, the faith of the users they will uh, go away and then it becomes harder uh, to regain that faith i am not saying that it does it will not happen i mean all the good projects are here to stay uh, but uh, I think what it does is it basically sets back the industry a couple of years uh, just because, you know, someone thought that they can make a quick money and exit. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important to remind our listeners that crypto is all about building trustless networks, like you mentioned. And what went wrong here is we trusted somebody, which is the exact thing that crypto is being built to get away from. Because even if you have good people that are running good companies, eventually they're going to retire or the company is going to get bought, sold and bought. And the next person who may come in may run into the ground or may be a bad actor. And just getting away from that entire framework of running a company and doing business is why we're building in crypto in the first place. So while in the short term, yeah, it does kind of shine a bad light on this industry. I think if people stop to think about it for a second, they'll realize, hey, actually, this further proves the case of crypto itself and all these decentralized networks. Uh, it just goes to show even the, the best guy out there who's getting all the attention, who seems like he can't miss, is still doomed to fail. But even in all that, uh, these decentralized networks still held up strong. The ones that have been here to withstand the test of time like Maker and Compound, Ethereum and whatnot. So uh, Bitcoin, of course, uh, kept on rolling as it always does. It doesn't have any messaging to know what's going on in the news. So yeah, it's great. So uh, Harsh, thank you so much for spending the last half hour with us. It was great to pick your brain. Thank you so much for everything you've built over there at push protocol. I'm sure all of us listening will be using it at some point. And if we have any more questions about getting into the industry as a builder or um, anything, you know, where can we follow you for more information? Gone. So, guys, like Twitter, crypto, and Twitter, they go hand on hand, yep. Uh, yep. at least till the time Twitter <laughs> operates. So, uh, uh, you can follow me at uh, Harsh Rajat, H A R S H R A G A T. Just tag me in case you need any help. Uh, in case you want to learn about push, just go to push.org and uh, you can see all the things that we are doing. Uh, and through that, you can go through the uh, protocol uh, uh, Twitter handle as well. Uh, also, thanks, Pizza Mind, for having me. I I really love this podcast. It was one of the most uh, one of the more interesting ones that I had uh, recently. So oh, yeah. we really appreciate you coming on, and we can't wait to bring you back. Uh, there's a lot of things we're going to do together to build Web3 into an even better world. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, Push Protocol, everyone. Go check it out. And we'll be back later in the week with another great podcast here at Crypto 101.